Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Here with me today is Lori Williams. She is the HR director, the director of human resources. Not sure if it has to be either way, but of the general conference. Lori, is there a proper way? Is it director of human resources, HR director, same thing? It's it pretty much the same thing. We usually use director of human resources. Okay. See, I got it right on the second round. Yeah. So, um, Lori, I'm so glad that you're able to be here with me today. Thank Lori, you. you and I kind of know each other from before we were at the general conference yes. because my husband and you worked together at the review and herald many years ago that's true um not many just a few years ago right? no we it's don't been many. okay <laughs> we're, we're willing to acknowledge the many okay so um when when we first got married i i met you at that time and so we've known each other off and on and then when i moved back here you were one of the first faces that i got to see when i was employed by the general conference. So yep. thank you. It was a very welcoming face in yeah. the midst of a crazy move. Yes. So. I understand how that can be. <laughs> so here on the podcast, we kind of go back and we learn life stories. Generally, most of the people we talk to are pastors. So we kind of get this typical trajectory, but you're not a pastor. No. You work in HR. So I'm very excited to hear your story. So let's start off with very basics. Um, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your parents. Okay. Well, um, you probably don't hear this very often either, but I actually was born in Maryland. I was born in Hagerstown, Maryland. And um, I've actually lived, prob lived, obviously I work further than that away now, but I probably lived within 30 miles of Hagerstown my whole life. And I know most people that work at the General Conference, that is not the case. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, even so, if they came from America, they rarely come from like, we've been in Maryland our whole lives. Yeah. Now, I live in West Virginia right now, but that piece of West Virginia is still within about 30 miles of Hagerstown. So um, I'm not one of these people that have been all over the country and lived in many, many places. I've not lived in a lot of houses. Um, my parents... Um, my dad was a book publisher. He worked for Doubleday Company for many, many, many years, retired from there. Um, and my mother was a nurse, and uh, she uh, worked part-time for most of our childhood and um, then then retired from being a nurse. So you were born in Hagerstown? Yes. At the Hagerstown Hospital? Yes. That's where my children were born. Too. There you go. So see, I, I don't think it's there anymore. Didn't they get rid of it? No, them? it's a new, different place. Yeah. That's, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Neither here nor there. <laughs> um, so you're born in Hagerstown. Tell me about your early childhood. Were, were you raised a Seventh-day Adventist? Um, what were your early memories like? Um, yes, I was raised in the church. Um, I went to Mount Etna Elementary School. Um, we only lived about a mile from the school. Actually, we lived right across, most of my childhood, we lived right across the entrance from the Mount Etna camp <laughs> on, in a house there. Um, I have one brother who is uh, younger than I. And um, after I went to elementary school, I um, graduated from Highland View Academy. So it was all right there. It's in all right in this area. one little yeah, area. I didn't go to um, a boarding school or anything. Um, and my childhood was pretty typical, really. Um, you know, the neighborhood kids and playing ball in the fields and, you know, that type of thing. What were your, because um, since I now know that you also have gone through all half of this education here, at least through high school, let's talk about your um, experience in Mount which th this is actually a very fun conversation to me because I worked at Highland View Academy. My daughter went to Mount Etna, you know, um, elementary school. It, it feels kind of like talking to someone and coming home. Like generally these conversations don't feel like I, I'm like, can you tell me where that is in what country? It yeah. is? This is like coming <laughs> home to me. So let's talk about Mount Etna though. Do you have any special memories any any remembrances of teachers or meaningful experiences that you had as a young person? Um, I mean, I don't have any like real real 
um, experiences that just like jump out at me. I remember being a first grader at Mount Etna. My teacher was uh, Phyllis Carr, who still goes to the Hagerstown Church. Um, I see her every now and then when I go in that church. Um, and I remember that my parents and my brother were going to take a trip on that day. I'm in first grade and I, <laughs> I guess I wanted to go with them. I, I don't really remember, but, um, I remember telling my friend that after you don't see me anymore, you can tell the teacher that I'm walking home. Cause I, I mean, but it was, it was only like a mile away. So I started down the road. And she must have told the teacher because very shortly thereafter, after the you teacher. Don't see me. <laughs> after you don't see me, just tell the teacher I'm gone. <laughs> and uh, she came driving down and picked me up and took me back to school. I was about halfway home. <laughs> I mean, but that was first grade. But I had great teachers. Um, I remember Mrs. Welker, who was our my third and fourth grade teacher. She... Um, she always took us on these great field trips, and um, she always had um, – she always did these programs where we were learning all these songs, you know, like the 50 states and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I remember that very well in third and fourth grade, and um, – I remember she always used to make me sing, and I always wanted to not do that. I, I remember that piece of it. But, you know, we'd have to dress up in these crazy wigs and all these little outfits <laughs> for historic things, you know. <laughs> but um, – and we had – and I remember, you know, other teachers were good, too. They just don't stand out to me as much. Mr. Stevens was um, an upper-grade teacher. He actually lived beside us, um, and he was really – really great teacher too. And, um, I never had a, you know, large classes going through Mount Etna. Um, so, you know, I knew, went through school with most of the kids, went all the way through school and a lot of them even into academy. So it was a very, um, uh, not city type environment in any way. Yeah. Well, for, for those people who don't know, because obviously you and I were just like, oh, Hagerstown, we're all like, whatever. So Hagerstown is, was kind of like a little bit of an Adventist bubble area. A little. Um, calling it a little bubble. So the Review and Herald Publishing House was there for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, they have a boarding school. They have an elementary school. They have multiple churches. So because of the Review and Herald's presence, it kind of, it seemed a little bit more bubbly yeah. than you know, just a typical area that has a true house. So they, it kind of just to help our, our viewers understand this is where we're, we're being raised. Um, this is, you know, what is kind of happening. So in light of that, you're, you're in Adventist elementary schools and stuff, but that doesn't always mean like you're just naturally like, oh yes, and I just love the church and everything. Do you, were there any pivotal moments would you say in those elementary years, things that like helped you like fall in love with Jesus more? Did, were you part of like adventurers? How were you involved in your, at the church level during those years? Um, I really never did like the Pathfinder thing. I, in camp, I went to camp some, um, but I lived right there. So I really didn't stay at the camp. It was kind of like I was a day camper. So, um, I had that experience. Um, and I mean, we were always very active in the church as far as, you know, going to Sabbath school and church and being involved in the, you know, whatever activities were going on. My parents, I remember were involved in a, they used to call it a young married couples club, <laughs> which makes me laugh now, but, you know, and then the kids were, you know, the kids would just all get together, and, and that was all part of the church at that point. Because uh, we went to the Hagerstown, the old Hagerstown church, which was on, used to be on Route 40 in Hagerstown. Um, and that's actually the church I got married in, but it has burned down. <laughs> so it's not there anymore, and they have the new church over on Route Which is with. the church I used to mm -hmm. attend. So, so you went to Highland View Academy. Yes. So all four years. Yes. Correct. So what was academy years like? Um it was it was good. It was good. I um I had my first year there I worked in the print shop which was interesting. Um I had a great supervisor and one of the older students were working there and we kind of worked together on stuff. Um and then right after that I went I started working in the business office my sophomore year and then I finished out there. I just stayed there the whole time the rest of the time. And, um, Mr. Patterson was the, the boss in the business office. And, 
Um, he taught us a lot. We had several students working there and, and it was a really good experience. I feel like I learned a lot in that time frame. You know, uh, I think I matured during that time, plus the, you know, the basic accounting information that I was able to pick up at that point. Teachers were all great. Um, and I just enjoyed my time there immensely. So, you know, I, <clears throat> I grew up in a, a time, we all worked. I worked my whole way through school. Um, and I actually, when I worked at the at Holland View County, I was in the business office helping people find work. There you go. So there's a lot of a lot of struggle, it seems like nowadays, with young people finding jobs to work. I don't think it's that they don't necessarily want to work, but sometimes it's just hard to find jobs. What do you think having those early years in being able to learn job skills, how did that help you later on in life? I think it helped me tremendously because I think for one thing, it taught me how to work. Um, and I think that's something that maybe we're lacking in some ways, you know, um, things are so easy in some areas where, you know, the kids don't have to work. And then when they get out of school and they're trying to find a job, you know, it's like a culture shock to them almost that they don't, that they have to keep the schedule and they have to, um, do what somebody else tells them to do, that kind of a thing. So I, in my mind, it's a great learning experience and I think it should be required of every academy age student that they have to have some kind of a job that they're responsible for. It doesn't have to be, you know, a big job, but something that they are required to be there and do and make sure that they have their assignment accomplished. Yeah. I, <clears throat> Because my children now go to a day academy, and it's very hard to find work for mm -hmm. 14, 15, 16-year-old children. This is something I have found because yes. I tried to find my kids' jobs because they all wanted them, but it's just not as easy mm -hmm. these days. Um, and I sometimes think that when we when we get fresher with our young people for not having it, it's like, but we actually don't have the same amount of availability with jobs. Well, I especially like. in a day academy. I think the jobs are a little more frequent at the boarding academies. That is true. That is true. So um, one of the things I appreciate here about at the general conference is that your department has a summer intern program where we do have a number of young people who come during the summer, mm -hmm. um, summer student workers, basically, and they come and they work in different departments and stuff. And we are able to pour into them and help them learn those same skills like we learned right. when we were young. Exactly. So trying to give people as many opportunities as we can. And mm -hmm. I see that you are carrying that on here into this, this role as well. So what about spiritually? I know a lot of young people, you know, we go through kind of like, I'm going to call it like a rebellious phase. <laughs> did you ever struggle with that? Or did you kind of just always know I'm an Adventist? I, f I feel like an Adventist. And each of us are kind of different in how our journey is. True. That's very true. Um, I've always been the type of person that, and I'm not sure how to say this exactly, but, um, you know, I'm the one that, that follows the rules kind of a thing. So I never really had a rebellious stage when it comes to that. I mean, have I had questions? Absolutely. Everybody does. But I've always felt pretty grounded. Um, you know, my, my upbringing and my education um, have helped me to feel like that it's, you know, it's, it's the way, it's the right way. It's the right thing. It, you know, I feel like it has helped my relationship with Jesus. And, um, I've never really just had a period where I'm like, I just threw it all up in the air and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it or anything like that, where I know some people go through those phases. Do you ever feel like it's easy then to become complacent? Absolutely. So how, um, how do you struggle through that? Um, by it, it's, it's, it is a struggle. It can be, I can have that struggle daily sometimes. It's just, you know, and, and, you know, when you even talked about inter having me to, to interview, I'm like, well, I don't have a big conversion story to tell anybody. Um, I just try to stay as focused as I can to make sure I'm spending time with the Lord. Um, each day. Um, I don't always succeed, to be honest. I try really hard, but sometimes I mess up. 
just like everybody does. Um, but that if I can tell the difference, if I don't take the time to spend time with the Lord before I start my day, it makes a difference in how things go for me. And I tend to get more discouraged and frustrated. And, um, so, and especially since I've taken this position, um, I find myself praying a lot more through the day, you know, just, you know, give me the wisdom I need to, to make this decision and, and help me to see things clearly. And, and that's, that's the only thing I've been able to determine is I just have to stay focused to make sure that I'm including God in, in everything that I'm doing and, and to spend the time with him that I need to. You know, I actually, I appreciate your testimony in this because, well, the idea of having this big testimony and like, you know, I was like totally into drugs and I almost died, but then got, it's, it's great and we need those. But actually for many people, your testimony is their testimony. Most of us have grown up, we do the same things and we don't have, it's actually just a daily process for almost all of us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's actually one of the most powerful testimonies because it shows consistency in a relationship. And consistency is one of the hardest things that humans have. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's much easier in a way to, you know, be kind of like on a roller coaster. Um, but consistency like the stability, the the measuring each day, as you said, how is my walk with God today? Mm -hmm. And just constantly making those, those slight things and also recognizing if I, if I don't have my devotions today, it's okay. God forgives me and I can just start again tomorrow. It doesn't have to be like this, like, oh no, my life is over. Like he will never forgive me. It, that's not what it is. It's having that but, consistency. But it is hard sometimes not to do that to yourself. Why do you think that is? Honestly, I think it's because part of it has been the the things that have been beaten into my head through the years, you know. And, and you know, I mean, I've worked for the church my whole career. And, you know, you feel like there's certain expectations of you. And if you're not fulfilling those expectations... At least my personality tends to beat me up <laughs> for that. You and I are very similar. <laughs> so um, I think, and it's not anybody's fault. It's just the way things are sometimes and um, and the way my personality is. So, so and this is a little bit different than how we normally go, but actually I'm really appreciating this conversation because I feel like it, it makes the most sense for most people. This is, we are most people's stories because mine is very similar. I just, you know, I've just kind of never, I've never really questioned. I'm like, I've struggled, but I've never questioned. Mm -hmm. When we are, when we are going through all of this, when, when, when we struggle, what would be words of advice you would have to somebody? Because there are so many people who are struggling today as they are even listening to this, they they probably are thinking back, like, I don't remember the last time I picked up my Bible, or I don't remember the last time I actually had something meaningful out of what I read. What what would you say to kind of inspire them? Um, I would say that I've had the, exactly that same experience. Um, there are times when I read my Bible and I'm like, I know I just read those words, but I could not repeat those to you if I had to. So I guess my advice would be an encouragement would be to don't give up. Um, God understands exactly where you're at. And he will, in his time, show you exactly what he wants you to do. And just keep spending time with him. Keep praying. And, you know, some people... And me being one of them, music is extremely important to me. And I can hear a song on a certain day where maybe I didn't have time to spend as much time in worship as I should have. And that song will smack me upside the head. And I maybe are trying to sing along with it. And I maybe and I won't be able to get through it because the song is just so powerful to me. So my, my encouragement and my advice is just don't, don't stop. Just because you've missed some time and you feel like you've fallen by the wayside, jump back on the road 
and just keep going. I love that you that you mentioned the music because actually music I find is the way God speaks to me. If he really, really wants to get through to me, it's almost always a song. Like I can, I can narrow it down to very specific, huge moments in our life. And I'd be driving or something and a song would come on and I, I would have to pull over because it was like everything God wanted me to know, he was speaking through someone else's voice. Do you think sometimes like we, we kind of think that there's like this perfect way to do worship and maybe we've missed out? on actually understanding that worship is so much broader and bigger than what we think. Oh, absolutely. Um, I struggle with that sometimes because it's, you know, I, I think, okay, well, I've spent my 30 minutes here, but I don't feel like anything has happened. So, you know, I, I yeah, it's like, how, how am I supposed to do this? Talk to me, Father, and tell me what is it that I'm not miss that I'm missing? Um, show me how I'm supposed to be worshiping you. And and I think getting in a rut sometimes, I have that problem. You know, I'll just do the same thing over and over and over again. Well, it's not working anymore. <laughs> so then we got to, you know, make an adjustment or figure something else out or, you know, just just figure it out. I It's just, it's not, I, I wish I could say that I, I feel, and maybe my experience is different than many, but I wish I could say that it's just so easy because I, I just start and, you know, my worship just flows out of my mouth and my head, you know, gets wrapped around everything, but it doesn't work that way for me. I, I think for most people that I talk to, because, you know, I interact with people on social media because that's one of the things I do. So I take care of the social media channels for the World Church. Actually, that's what most people feel. And I think it's actually more rare for it to be this every day is this this mountaintop experience, I think for most of us, we're just walking along, you know, this path. And mm -hmm. some days we see the mountaintop. Some days it kind of just feels like a deserted valley <laughs> of dry bones, you know. And and I think the, the point is to keep walking. Yes, exactly. To keep walking. Yeah. So um, that was a little tangent, but I think it was a, a very valuable tangent. <laughs> but so you graduated from Highland View Academy. Where did you go to college? I actually went to Southern Adventist University, which was called Southern Missionary College at that point. But uh, yeah, I have a, I only have a two-year degree, um, and I ended up getting my associates and then uh, got married that year. That okay, what year. was your associates in? Office administration. Excellent. It has served you well for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> um, what made you decide to do that? Did any of your high school experience kind of do it or just you, to what, would pick that? Degree? What made you decide office assistant? I, you know, I and this is kind of embarrassing, really, at this stage in my life. But <laughs> I mean, I never I never really thought that I was going to have a career. I, I never. This planned. is very intriguing. On having a career. I thought that I would need to work, that I would get married, that I would have children, and I would stay home. I, and I know that that sounds really weird at the, in this stage of the world, in this time of life, but that's what I thought all those years ago. I, I never And really, you didn't hate that thought, though. No, but I didn't, I didn't have a plan to be a career person. So... That's why I picked that because I knew it was a it was something I was good at and I knew that I could find a job and be successful at it and as long as I needed to have a job and and things didn't work out exactly like I thought they were going to. You're like so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am with a career. <laughs> And we're grateful for it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I am and you know and and I think back because when I first started my career, I was I worked at Shady Grove Hospital. Okay, and I was in. I started in purchasing. Then I moved to HR, for and then I left and came to the review. And I was working as a secretary through all this this point. And um, I got to the review, and that was my intention. I was I was planning on being the pres the president's secretary. That's that was my goal. So you had, so if you were picking your trajectory, you're yeah. like, I will become the president's secretary. Assistant. Yeah. I would be their executive assistant. That's where I thought I was headed. And um, that uh, position actually came open after I had been there, not all that long, a couple of years, maybe not even that long. And 
a lot, several people applied for the job and um, they chose, somebody was chosen that hardly had any experience. So everybody was all upset. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was kind of like, oh, well, okay. But then not too long after that, an opportunity came for me to move in to work with one of the vice presidents who actually also did HR. And, well, it was personnel at that point, but So I went ahead and took that position. And then from there, things just kind of morphed. Snowballed. And I just kept moving and moving and moving and moving. And and I just never left HR after that. And it's just kind of, I think back on that time and I'm like, well, you know what? If I would have gone, gotten my wish and gone in the direction I thought I was supposed to go in, I would have never... I would have never gotten this opportunity at all. I would have just been there and probably been there for years and never made an adjustment. You know, it's interesting is sometimes that we see things and we have our perfect plans. Like, you know, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Um, When I was 18, I I had my trajectory. I am not on my trajectory. (laughs) Um, Often we plan things. And God is like, well, if you're willing to, I'm willing to take you on a different journey, mm-hmm. but you have to be open to it. And there are moments in the journey, like when you didn't get the job um, as a president's executive assistant, to you, this was kind of, it seemed kind of like the ultimate. This is, yeah, this was the right. ultimate. This is what you had dreamed. And God was like, I have so much bigger dreams for you, Lori. And you're, you're just, you're putting yourself in this box mm-hmm. and I, I want you to come out of this box. Yep. Why do you think that we sometimes struggle with allowing this, that journey to unfold like that? Why? Um, I, I mean, I think it could be numerous reasons, but I think most of it is because we like to have everything mapped out. We're not really good at being like Abraham and saying, sure, I'll leave all my family and everything I have and go someplace. Where was it? Do you want me to go? <laughs> So I I think that's a lot of it, you know, and somebody that, like me, that likes to have a little more control over what's going on, which is not a good thing all the time. Sometimes it's very good, though. Well, sometimes. Sometimes not, but yes. Yeah. (laughs) So I think it's difficult to think in a different direction than what your head is thinking because you don't, you know, you either don't have the confidence to think that that's a, a good option or... You know, or you just don't want to go into the unknown. So let's talk about you coming out of Southern. Okay. So you go to Southern Missionary College at that time. Mm-hmm. My parents also graduated from SMC. Um, Southern Matrimonial College. Yes, it was. Now, did Southern Matrimonial College work out for you too? No, no did not work out. No, I met my husband in high school. My, my mom and dad met in high school too, so. <laughs> Um, actually, I think they were married between their freshman and sophomore year in college or something. I don't know. I, I should know this, right? They're yes, my parents. Should. That's okay. I know how many years they've been married, so I guess I could try to, like, Figure backdate their life, but that's okay. Um, so you, so you, act, oh, well, actually, we're going to revisit that. I'm going to, we're going to table that thought, put it over here. You met your spouse in high school. Mm-hmm. So tell me about him. <laughs> tell me about tell you about my husband yes okay well um from then or now (laughs) oh just tell like how did you guys meet well he came he came to highland view when uh, in our sophomore year he was in the same class i was he had been to ta which tacoma academy which is right around the corner from here um he lived had lived in the annapolis gambrels area um went to beltsville school and that kind of thing and um he had actually uh, come up to this area because he was dating somebody else <laughs> and, and they had talked him into coming to the school and we met and connected and we dated for a couple of years then and we actually broke up for a while um, and then I went away to college he stayed here and then we got back together um, he worked at the dairy farm at Highland View when he was there and also um, mixed pretzels at the pretzel, Dutchie pretzel factory which is now Hadley Farms they don't I don't think they even do pretzels anymore I don't they, think do so. I think they do sweet rolls or yeah, something breads or something um so he he um had that experience on the farm it <laughs> we always said you never can 
there's not a scent that you can describe that is from being on the farm with the cows and trying to cover it up with cologne. It's, <laughs> it's a distinctive, a distinctive smell. But anyway. That's true. I remember when I went to academy, I think we had a farm at our academy too. And there is, there's just like this smell. And mm-hmm. you can try really hard, but it just it just doesn't no. really go away. No, so you could always tell the guys that worked at the farm. But anyway, it was, all right. It was so, good. so he does not follow you to Southern. No, is he one of the reasons why you decided to come back to Maryland, or did you just always know you wanted to come back home? Like Maryland um, just was your happy place. It's. I didn't really think about it that much. It just kind of happened. Um, when I was halfway through at Southern, then um, he came down to see me. We got back together and. Anyway, so that, yeah, when it all gets said and done, that is the reason I came back. Um, but yeah, I just, it's just always, I if I would have connected with somebody else at Southern and got married and moved, I would have moved, but it, there just was never really the opportunity. My parents lived there and then he was living here. So we got married and we lived here and, and then I worked here and there was just, just never, <laughs> never the reason to go anywhere. So so you worked at Shady Grove, and then you, you ended up at the Review and Herald. Mm-hmm. So this is where kind of like the trajectory towards HR kind of comes in. Right. So you start off as the assistant to the vice president. Where do you go from there? Um, oh, that's a lot of years ago. Let me see. I think they... They I'm moved. not trying to make you sound old. I'm just that's okay. I, mean, you, I am. You're the old. one who keeps saying the lot of years. I'm just going to point no. out. You don't. Here's the thing that you don't seem old to me. Oh well, you good. never Thank have. You. you always seem like you're. <laughs> I guess you know the thing is I knew you when I was in my early like late teens, early twenties. But in my mind, I guess I'm still really young, so I still see you as like forties. Oh, awesome! <laughs> and I realize I'm 43, so we all have to kind of grow up, don't we? Yes. It's- <laughs> It just happens. It's, it's problematic. Nothing, nothing you can do about it. But anyway, um, I just kind of kind of moved through the process. I think personnel coordinator, and then they made me the assistant director. And then eventually, not too long after that, they actually moved me into an, an office where there was an HR office. Because there for a while, they didn't really have a department. Um, they did, and then they didn't. But then they put me back in that spot. So, and then... And then I just moved into director, and I was there for a lot of years. I served as the HR director there. What are the biggest challenges of serving as an HR director in the Adventist Church? Oh, my. I don't think you have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Or what are the biggest challenges for you as, as, a, as a human, as a, as a person? What are the biggest challenges that you, that you struggle through as an HR director? Um, I think... My biggest challenge is is trying to make everybody that we deal with feel like they're important and their issues are important. Um, you know, sometimes we get so busy doing things that, you know, you might have somebody come in that maybe to us seems like a really petty thing. And it's like, wh- what are you talking about? But I don't ever want anybody to feel that that's the case. Their their issues are their issues and they're important to them. It doesn't matter if it's not important to me or to anybody else in the department that they're looking for. So to me, that's that's the biggest challenge to to make sure that the staff understand that we care about what's going on in their lives. If they've got a challenge that we can help them with, we want to be there. Um, you know, point them in the right direction to find the information they need or um even just pray with them or or cry with them or whatever we need to do to make them understand and to feel like we're glad they're there and we appreciate them. Um, to me, that's the biggest you know, challenge and um, goal, I guess I would say. When I moved here, I don't know if you remember this, it we kind of, it was like past her committee and like two weeks later we were moving. Oh yeah. I yeah I'm sure you remember that. that. Um, <laughs> it was very sudden. Um, and I know your team went through a lot of hard work and probably headaches that thank you on behalf of my family. Thank you. You're because welcome. it was very hard. We were moving very quickly and I had been a stay at home mom. 
I, well, work at home mom for 14 years. And I uprooted my children just as they were starting high school and middle school. And you made it so that my family could get here as the school year started rather than a month or two later, which would have been very hard on them. And I remember coming into the building and meeting with what is now your team. Mm -hmm. And everything you just described is exactly what we felt. We felt loved. We felt valued. We felt supported. And we did not make it easy with the whole fastness of this and all that. But we never felt like we were an inconvenience. Praise God. And um, and I, I've talked with many people. And we all we all have had the same experience with HR. HR could be seen as a a service. It is. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. You guys are a service. Um, but I think you see it as a ministry. You are there to support the people in this building, to make sure we have what we need when we need it. And sometimes it's not always in the best situations. HR often has to deal with sticky situations too. Mm -hmm. What is that like for you? Because you're talking about you're a rule follower, but I also can see you're a people person. Um, and, and you want to show, how does that impact you as a person? Well, it's, it's very difficult, you know, when you have a situation where you're having to talk to somebody about an issue that's come up or whatever. Um, it, it's hard for me to do that. I, I would much rather just give them a hug and say, you know, do better next time. <laughs> But, you know, that's not always not the role of HR. <laughs> no, that's not always what we can do. So, you know, I try to just be open with the individual, um, be honest with them, let them know where we're at. Um, a lot, most of the time, by the time we have the situation, there's already been several conversations. So it's not like it's a big a surprise, surprise. <laughs> and to most people. But um, and, and just realize there's always two sides to the story and, and try to get as much information as possible so that the, the best decision is made. But it's not easy. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've had people tell me, oh, I'm so glad I don't have your job. I'm like, well, thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Because I hear that one, too, and I'm like, I like my job. I do I like my job? It's like you start like questioning, like maybe I shouldn't be liking my job as much as I do, or whatever. Yeah. But I think some of us are built for the jobs we're in. Yeah. Um. It, it seems like this is a very logical fit, and it seems like it's the route that God has has brought you on very clearly. So, how many years were you at the Review and Herald? Um. Well, even after I started working at the GC, I was still working at the Review and Herald. I they actually kept me on there. I was I served as the HR director even after I came here. So counting that, it was probably like almost 35 years. I was at the review and I was the director probably close to 30. That's a couple years. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were so you're at the review and you were at the review and Harold doing some very hard times. Yes. Um you were there during what becomes really the the end of that. So you were probably able to see some of the, the best years, some really beautiful years within it, and and see its ultimate, what do we call it, dis, dis, dissolution? Well, what? it's not dissolution no. because we technically have the review on Herald now. Yes. But as we, as we had it in the past. The, bu the building the closed. The building and the... The hundreds printing. of employees. Mm -hmm. How did that, how did you, how did you emotionally process all that, seeing everything that was happening? Because at HR, you are also part of the people who laid off all of those people through that process. Everyone. I know because my husband saw you. And I remember that morning very well. Yeah. And I want you to know, he he felt loved, even though it was hard. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> that wasn't part of the deal. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure somebody on my video team here can get us tissues. Um, <laughs> those are really hard years for all of us. Mm -hmm. Because we so desperately wanted 
We wanted the, the mission of the church to go forward. But you're put in this really hard position of having to let people go who feel this mission through this struggle. How did you, how did you emotionally cope with it? Not very well in some days. Um, you learn when you're in HR that you have to somehow disconnect yourself from some of this stuff. You have to not, not disassociate so much, but you have to somehow step away a little bit because if you don't, you are torn to shreds, basically. Your emotions just, you, you just can't, I can't, I couldn't deal with it if I didn't do it that way. And to watch, I mean, basically, every one of my friends, I had to call into the office and, and give them paperwork to tell them that they weren't working anymore at various periods through the time, you know, through the years, because it, it actually went over several years before the, everybody was taken care of and it it it's just I think that God just somehow gave me a, a curtain maybe that that blocked out some of it um some things were harder than others um, by the time I got to the end everybody kind of knew it was coming and you know it wasn't <laughs> that big a deal the first group was extremely hard they didn't you know it's like well why why am I going first you know, it was almost kind of like that. And and I think, if I remember right, Trent actually got caught in the group right before we even knew the building was going to close, if I'm thinking correctly. I don't, I don't remember. But it was the same year, I know. It was... Um, I'm pretty sure. We were, I don't really remember. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it, I remember matter, it was pretty early on the process. It's but. all very... It's just hard. You just kind of have to concentrate. Try not to, to get hard in the process because you want to be as yeah, sympathetic human. sympathetic as possible but to also mostly concentrate on the facts you know you're you're here's your papers this is what i need you to do do you have any questions you know that kind of thing and in as kind and loving way as you possibly can and then when they leave there there were many days when i would leave the building and cry the whole way home because i don't i didn't like to take my work home so I tried to get it all worked oh. out, you know, so that when I got home, I wasn't dealing with it then. HR carries a burden that some of us will never understand. And um, I can't speak on behalf of everybody. But I want to speak on behalf of my husband and I. Thank you for the respect and compassion with which you carried that out. Because I don't know if you've ever heard that. And sometimes... Things are often left unsaid that need to be said. But thank you. Thank you. The next morning we woke up. And it was the first time we'd woken up and he didn't have to go to work, really. And I remember talking about it and the peace we felt. Um, I was not working. <laughs> so this was quite a, a, a shock. I mean, literally the next day. He's not at the office. Mm -hmm. It's not like a two week. I mean, it was a, it was very fast. Um, there was severance. So yeah. <laughs> just for all the viewers, you know, we were good. Um, but we had the peace because of the kindness with which he had been treated. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that. And I see that in how you talk about all of this is that you love people, but you also have to do your job. And it's, it, HR has got to be, I wouldn't want to say I don't want to have your job, but it's a hard job. And it's, it's one that we, we rarely say the nice things about it um, because we, it's either like, well, you're hiring me. So, you know, hire me, get that taken care of. Or there, it's generally because of a problem. You know, we don't normally see HR in this like. Oh, yay. <laughs> like, this is big kumbaya. Look, they're all getting us all together. Although you guys do. You you bring together us for gatherings and stuff like that. But it's, HR is not always the one you're like, oh, you, you know, HR needs to see you. It's like, yeah, why? It's kind of oh, like when yeah. legal says they need to see me. I'm like, um, why do you, why does Karnik need to see me? That's like always my greatest fear. Karnik needing to see me. <laughs> um, anyways, that's a whole nother story, which I'll explore in an episode with Karnik when he called me up there and terrified me and it was not even scary at all but um 
you moved to the general conference. So apparently you kind of do some interim years with both. Mm-hmm. Or was it kind of like after the building went away, you were still kind no. of saying, okay. No. When I, I, cause I came to the GC in 2015. Um, <clears throat> when I first started, I was still doing at least a day a week at the GC. I mean, at the review. review. Um, and I was here three days a week and there a day. And um, I just, even as we still had employees for a long time till like, uh, I can't even remember, 18, 19 maybe. We technically still have an employee. Do we have N or two? Um, we, there are two employees right now. Okay. I was going to say like, it is not gone. It's not no. gone, everyone. <laughs> no, the Review and Herald is just a, a publisher now. They are not a printer. Um, and if anybody's interested in talking about Review and Herald stuff, they can contact Melinda Worden, who is the vice president for operations. There's still a board. There's still an administrative committee that makes decisions on, on the work that they do. I just got something in Intermail the other day that Stewardship had done. I think it was Stewardship. Um, that had the Review and Herald as a publisher on it. So Does it kind of make you happy when yes, you see that? Yes, it makes me very happy. I love the little R. Like, it just makes me happy to see Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, the Review and Herald is listed on the sign outside That's the GC true. building. So this is actually the address for the Review and Herald now. So... It's that's that part's very exciting. So to now me. when you came 2015 is a GC session year. So I'm just going to ask, is your position an elected a position, an appointed position? Where does you were you an associate? At that Not time? when I first came, okay. I wasn't. I actually when I first got here, I was working in benefits. I was okay. um, doing the benefit thing that Kathleen Williams does right now. We really appreciate you guys in benefits. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the following year. Um, Ruth Parrish retired and, and Lori went in, Lori Yingling went in as the director. And then at that point I went in as the associate and that is an, that is an appointed position through ADCOM. Okay. So because some people might not know this, what's the difference between appointed and elected? Oh my, it's a very confusing thing. (laughs) (laughs) Elected is when it's like a GC session or at, um, an annual council spring meeting, usually annual council, but it could be spring meeting. Um, it's where there's a wider vote that goes with it. The executive committee will make a decision or, or GC session. An appointed position is something that's appointed. It goes to ADCOM, the GC ADCOM. So I'm an appointed position, for instance, as an assistant director. We are appointed. Mm-hmm. Um, I think our directors basically get to bring names to ADCOM. I think that's how it works. Usually, yeah. Like, I think. (laughs) I'm not really sure, actually. (laughs) I know that's how my case got there, but that's okay. So so is a director an elected position or appointed as well? In HR, that's actually appointed as well. Okay. So is this because it's more like a service rather than a department? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you served under Lori Yingling's leadership for um, the last... I don't know, 10 years? No, it has been, well, I, I was her, I've been her associate since 16. So what's that? Seven years. I don't know. I'm bad at math. Yeah. <laughs> Something like <laughs> well, that. Well, somebody who's good at math. Um, all right. So you served as an associate. What do you do as an associate director? Um, I was actually, my responsibility was employment. Um, so I worked with um, Johanna and as she, well, it was Ruthie before that. Um, as they work to get people in here, <laughs> basically to hire them to do the interviewing and the reference checking and all that kind of stuff, do the committee, get the committee information prep prepared. Um, and I also worked with compensation, um, you know, to make sure everybody's getting paid what they're supposed to get paid. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, payroll is in Treasury, obviously, but we work very closely with with payroll because we give them the information to pay everybody. And um, we just are a really very close team when it comes to that. Um, and, you know, just worked with the data entry for our HRS, HRIS system, um, which is human resources information system, where everybody's information is housed. Um, the self-service portal and all that kind of thing. So, so I have to ask another question. I believe you can correct me. You mentioned something back in elementary time. 
you mentioned that you had this teacher who you'd make you sing. Yeah. And you kind of like left off. But you actually sing. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Uh, More than sometimes. You're a very good singer. Has that been a part of, did you go, did you ever have lessons in it? What was your experience with music? Because music, you also indicated was something that is how God speaks to you. So music is something that's very um, much a core of who you are. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, my dad and mom both actually were singers. They had, we had this uh, group when I was a kid. Well, I was probably early teen. In, in that area um, that used to go around and sing at churches. Um, my uncle and aunt and cousins were in it. And so, the, you know, that kind of started it. My uncle was the, the kind of the leader of the group. And um, I always through high school, you know, I was in the choir and, and did that kind of thing and, and always liked it. I, I mean, I don't really sing that much anymore. Occasionally special music for church. Um, but I, I like it. Um, and it's just, I I do the best I can. (laughs) I praise God through it. You do beautiful. So I remember it because I feel like you did some stuff at Review and Herald Christmas Parish or something. Yeah, I I very well could have. I I was going to say, I just, I remember this. And I think you've even done some at General, here in the General Conference. Haven't Mm -hmm. you sung here? Yeah, see, you act like, oh, maybe at the church. No, you've you've sung in multiple places that I remember. Um, Why do you think music is so moving? Why is it such a part of who you are? Um. It's a good question. I've never really thought about it. It's just, I think it's just always been there. And um, since I like music so much, um, I think, I guess that's how it just, you know, why the words are so important to me in in songs. Um, It's, yeah, I, that's, I think that's probably, I don't think I have another answer other than that. It's just, it's just always been a very soothing soothing thing you know I can if I'm in a really good mood I can pick music that is upbeat and makes me happy if I'm a little down I can you know find some instrumental music that's more soft and can you know a little more soothing and so it's just there's just a lot of variety that that makes my life fuller my family always knows when I'm in a a mood um it, it's generally a mood of struggling to believe what God believes in me because they have this one song. And I think the most I've ever played on loop was like two and a half hours. Like I really needed God to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband was just like, Alyssa, we love her, but we're really tired of that <laughs> song. <laughs> but it's interesting how music can somehow pour into our hearts. Um, and speak life into us. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. So we, um, you're now, you've been the director. You you came into this role in August 2023. So we're just a f- couple months into this. Mm-hmm. If you could say what your vision is for HR um, at the general conference, what would that be? My vision. Um, I think I kind of already mentioned it, really. Um, my vision for the GCHR is that the employees feel welcome, they feel appreciated, that they feel like um, that whatever their problems are, that we're going to be there to help them, um, and that they can talk to us, they trust us. That's a really big one. I want the employees to trust the staff in the HR department that if we tell them that we're going to do something, that we follow through, and it happens exactly like we say. And if we can't do something, that we let them know and we communicate with them. So that that to me is, you know, there's all this other stuff that we have to do, you know, the benefits, and we have to make you sign forms, and we bug you when you don't do it. And, you know, that stuff gets annoying to people. I know they don't like it when we do that. It's part of what we have to do. But I think I'm hoping that my vision would be that when we have to do that, that you know that down deep we care about you. This is just you know, the stuff that we can't help about, you know, we can't help that, you know, if you really have an issue, you need to come talk to us about it and we'll do our best to help you get through it. 
What do you think are the biggest challenges that we face at the general conference um, in terms of employment? Um, I think a big challenge is finding people that want to work here that aren't worried as much about the money that we pay, which is, you know, especially in some of the most, a lot of the salaried positions is way less than you would get paid somewhere else to work. And, you know, to have, to, to get the word out there that the general conference is a viable employer for some of our people coming, our young people coming out of college, um, that, that would want to work here and work for the church and, and to see that they could come here and make a difference. Um, I think sometimes they feel like, uh, it's always the way it is and I don't want to be in that environment. And it, it really is, I, I think, sure, we have our challenges just like everybody else, but it's a good environment to work in. It's a good environment to grow in. It's a good environment to learn in. Um, and that would be, I think, a, a challenge. You know, we um, we talked earlier a little bit about the fact that we have summer student workers who come in, and for the last few summers, I've been able to have lunches with them mm -hmm. each week. And I find it interesting that every year we the last lunch because we every every week we have lunch with a different leader, so they kind of get to know different people, and we take them on a tour of the building so they can kind of like see the inner workings and. The last one, we always ask them, like, so what was your time like? We just kind of, like, ask them, like, you know, because we've, we've been with them all summer, so we've created a relationship. And almost all of them invariably say that it's not anything like what they expected. Oh, really? And they've all, the last group that we had, I think we had about 13 kids last summer, they all said they would come back and work again. Nice. Which is, I have a lot. It has a lot to say about the, the culture that the building has. They were very surprised by it, and they were all willing to come back. One young person actually is now working here. Um, I saw him in the hallway yesterday, and he just told me that he had taken a job. And I was really excited to mm -hmm. see him here. And he, his face lit up when he saw me. He's like early 20s. There are young people who are working in this building. Yeah, it's exciting. And it is. It's really exciting when I start seeing it. And we need to help them remember, yes, this is this is a place and this space wants you. We want your ideas. We want your creativity. Um, We're actually working on a, a more formalized internship program to try to catch some of the college students, too. Oh, I'm so, excited about that. Um, it, it's just in the very first stages of it, so I don't have all the details on it. But, yeah, so we're hoping. Because that, that's the main thing. We want them to understand that this is a viable employer. We want you to look at us and come work for us. And actually, the benefits are pretty great. Mm -hmm. Like, um, my daughter actually does want to be employed by the church. She's awesome. spent two summers now working at the general conference. And she has determined that she wants to work for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This was not anything I expected any of my kids to determine. Um, they've seen my husband through the Review and Herald experience. They've, you know, we've, they've seen all of it. But working here has given them a very different view of what they thought it was. So a lot of people think, you know, oh, the general conference, all these going to say what people think, not what, what it's a bunch of old men yeah. <laughs> in suits. <laughs> there are some older, I'm going to call them older um, men here and they are wearing suits, but it's actually a very diverse group, age, gender, um, ethnicity. Um, it, it's a, it's a beautiful <clears throat> picture of our global church. Mm -hmm. If you were to say <clears throat> any words of encouragement to this next generation of Adventists who are looking for, for ideas of where they can work outside of pastoral ministry, okay, what would your encouragement be to them? Well, I think they need to have an open mind um, and, and to remember that, you know, even if you're frustrated with the church right now for some reason you don't like the decisions that are made or whatever but that we're not supposed to look at the people and you know we're only responsible for ourselves and looking towards Jesus to make decisions and and keep our lives in focus with him and and to tell everybody about Jesus soon return and how much he loves us so i think my encouragement would be to try to to give us a try I mean, we have lots of different openings. I have an opening in HR right now. 
So, I'll you take, know, oh, wait, no, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there's lots of things that can be done. You know, communications, that's a great place. I agree. I mean, I don't know that you have any openings right now, <laughs> but maybe the, we can get an internship working in, in communications or something like that. You know, we have all the different departments, the trust services, the stewardship, women's ministry, children's ministries. You know, there there's just lots and lots of auditing, If you a treasury. They're looking for an accountant right now. Um, you know, that's just a business person that needs to be dedicated and want to work for the church. Um, and we would love to have um, applicants come and check us out and, and see what we have to offer them. Just don't count us out because you think we're too old and that there's nothing you can do because there is so much that you can do. And the only way we aren't old is if young people come. That's right. I mean, so they actually are the answer to the problem that people perceive. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not reality, the perception, they are the answer to that perceived problem. Mm -hmm. So just come take a tour, check us out, and give us an, give us an opportunity. Thank you, Lori. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed spending some time here with you. And thank, thank you. you for your dedication to helping the employees here in this building and throughout all your employment um, for the church. And thank you for making our lives a little bit easier and for fighting for us and getting us to fill out paperwork. Because <laughs> sometimes if we didn't fill out the paperwork, our lives wouldn't be so great. So thank you for your relentlessness on that as well. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ANN Profiles with my special guest, Lori Williams. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel, wherever it is you're tuning in from today. I don't want you to miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with me and join us next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.